Hey everybody, welcome to episode four of Stardom Space and Science Network's web series on astronomy, Clear Skies. I'm George. And I'm Eric. And we're here today at the Space Foundation in Colorado Springs to talk to you about some of the stuff that you're gonna need to learn about astronomy. Maybe you know a little bit, you got some questions, you don't know where to go to find the answers. That's what we're here for. Well, things like... I bought my telescope and I wanna start using it. Now what? Well, most telescopes are the same basic setup. You have a tube of some sort, either closed or open, and then either lenses or mirrors. You've got eyepieces, you've got some kind of support. You've got a stand, you've got a spotter scope, and you've got something to align the telescope with. But there are many other accessories, both for you and for your telescope, which you'll find extremely helpful when you're doing your astronomical observations. So we're gonna talk about a few of those throughout this episode. First up, accessories for you. Most astronomy takes place at night, and depending on where you are and what the weather is like, you're going to need something to stay warm. So you always want to bring a jacket or something like that because you have no idea what could happen. It could be 100 degrees during the day and then it could drop to freezing at night, because that's what it does here. <laughs> so you've got to be prepared for the rain, for the wind, for the heat, for all conditions. You've got to be comfortable. Just like any other outdoor activity, Astronomy can be pretty miserable if you're sitting out in the cold, in the wind, and you're wet, and you're hungry. It's no fun. And seriously, who wants to do that? Who wants to stand for hours waiting for the clouds to clear just so you can do astronomy? Nobody. Or how about if you're sitting comfortably? You've got warm feet, warm gloves, a hat on which keeps you comfy, 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 and you've got a belly full of food and a cup of hot chocolate on the table next to you much better, much more tolerable. Maybe then, astronomy's not so bad. The first thing on the accessories list is proper clothing. Like I said, you want to bring a jacket, something to keep your head warm. You also want some kind of hat for the daytime, wide brim hat, in case you are doing something like solar astronomy or even something just like setting it up. You're going to want something to keep you cool during the day, warm at night. That's most likely the most important thing you're gonna have the whole time. Don't forget, socks, boots, long johns, fleece underwear, uh, a poncho, a raincoat, umbrella, all these things, very, very helpful. Also, don't forget the not so obvious stuff, sunscreen. I'm not gonna be out there during the day, you might say. Well, you're probably gonna be wrong. You're gonna go out there early, you're gonna find yourself set up, maybe you stay overnight, and then you have to set up the next day. You're gonna be out there in the sun, you have gotta have your sunscreen. You need bug spray, depending where you are, you don't want to be eaten by mosquitoes. Hot drinks, cold drinks, meals, snacks. Maybe you're going to stay overnight, you're going to sleep in your car. Nothing wrong with that, but sleeping in your car without a blanket, without a sleeping bag, without a pillow, very uncomfortable. Bring them along. They're accessories that'll make astronomy better for you. Don't forget a folding chair to sit in and a table to place all your equipment on. You never want to leave your eyepiece case and your $300 eyepiece on the ground where you could kick it and roll it into the mud. <laughs> Is that voice of experience? No. <laughs> <laughs> now for the telescope itself. There are any number of accessories for your telescope, from covers to computers, that will help make your observing more enjoyable. You've got to ensure that your telescope is protected, makes it easier to use. You've got to keep out the rain, the wind, the sand, and the snow. To start with, your telescope, especially the mirrors, they've got to be protected from the elements. Okay, that means covers, plastic, a cloth, like this. Throw one of these on the front, like that, your telescope is safe. Well, we've got covers for everything on a telescope, for your eyepieces, for your mirrors. If you happen to have one that's open, we have entire covers you can wrap up your entire telescope. You might even want to bring a waterproof tarp. It starts to rain, you wrap it up, protects it from the rain. If you have a truss tube style telescope, you want a cloth that covers the full scope. That way, no dust can get in and it doesn't get knocked out of alignment. So you want to make the job of finding what you look for in the sky a little bit easier? One of the best investments that you can make is a good set of star charts. Now, these will allow you to reference and research exactly what it is you're looking for in the sky or at in the sky. To be able to read your star charts, you want a nice, good red light. And it doesn't have to be a super, super bright red light either. You just want a nice red light that you're able to read the star charts with. Why red? Because white light ruins your night vision and red light does not. So remember, it doesn't have to be a nuclear powered halogen. It just needs to be a good shade of red. 
Okay? There are also star charts available for cell phones, tablets, and computers, and those will also have red screens. So now, you're all dressed up nice, you're comfy, you're warm, you have your telescope all set up, you've chosen your target from the star charts. Now, you can get that scope pointed in the right direction to see what you want to see. You've got a spotter scope that will get you close to what you want to go to, but there's something which will help you make things much easier. It's called a telerad. And what it does is it has a clear window right here. You turn it on and you see a projected image of the sky and a bullseye. So if you lens with your spotter scope and your telescope, it allows you to, instead of having a narrow field of view, spotter scope, or even narrower, the actual telescope, this has zero magnification. So you look through it and you see exactly what you're seeing, only with a bullseye projecting on it. So you can tell, oh, I'm aimed exactly at this star, and now you can actually go in and fine tune what you're pointing at. Now, some of you might be thinking, I don't want to have to read anything. I just want to enter my target into a computer. I want to say, go to Saturn, and let the scope go there by itself and do the work for you. No, that is not the way to learn astronomy because you'll have absolutely no understanding or appreciation of what it is that you're looking at in the night sky unless you've worked for it, unless you've earned it. So go-to telescopes, like he said, are the kind that will just automatically go to your target. You either have a built-in computer or an external computer that you buy separately from the telescope. And this is connected to the mount, which can drive the telescope itself to the target. There's also a variation of that called push to, which is this kind, where you can choose to enter the coordinates if you want, and it shows you the arrows on how to find it, but it doesn't actually do it for you. The good thing about that is, with go-tos, you can often only control it with the motors, which means that if your battery's dead, you can't do anything. As a push to, if you do that, if your batteries are dead, you can use it anyways. Now, some telescopes can be fitted with motors. This kind, no, this is a push to, this is a dot. A refractor on a tripod mount and an equatorial, slap a motor on there, you can do it. Some of them come already with those, you can buy them through any telescope sales place. Another absolutely necessary accessory is called a collimator. Whenever the telescope is moved, whether being shipped by the company that made it or even carried up and down the stairs just to be able to set it up at night, there's a chance that the mirrors can get bumped around and misaligned. Note how I said mirrors because this generally only applies to reflecting telescopes. With refracting telescopes, you won't need to do this. They're already aligned at the factory and there is no simple way that you can do this at home. So if your mirrors are misaligned, your telescope's not going to work correctly. You might get blurry images, warped images, or depending how bad it is, you may not see anything at all. Now the alignment that takes care of that is called collimation, and the tool is called a collimator. Collimators come in many different styles, from a simple, simple plastic one with a hole in the center, like this, to laser ones that shine a beam of light down through your mirrors, back out, and let you align it much more precisely. Just make sure that you're able to check collimation and do an accurate collimation regularly because every time you move it, there's a chance that something could get knocked out. So once again, we hope we've piqued your interest in astronomy, space, and science. And we invite you to keep coming back. For more information, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Stardom Space and StardomSpace.com. And of course, as always, ask the kids to watch with you. Kids love to see other kids do an astronomy. Bye, everybody, and clear skies. What's going on, everybody? This is Ron Sparkman from Stardom, and today we have been filming our telescope and astronomy series here at the Space Foundation uh, called Clear Skies, and it's been an amazing day today. And uh, before we before we head out, we want to talk about some really cool things. You guys have seen Science on the Sphere in the background. Uh, there's some other things that are going on at the Space Foundation, and what a lot of people may not know is just how important it is to museums, especially museum directors like Travis, to consistently bring in new stuff to keep you interested and engaged and wanting to do uh, the cool things that they have here. So you guys have some new exhibits. Can you tell us a, a little bit about what you guys have going on that maybe uh, people that were here last year haven't seen yet? 
Well, if you haven't visited the Discovery Center since last year, we've opened a few new exhibits, uh, the largest of which is Mission to Europa. This exhibit lets us explore what would it be like to go on a mission to Europa. The centerpiece of this exhibit is the Scott Carpenter Station, which was NASA's submarine. If you didn't know NASA had a submarine, we have it on display, fully restored, and we actually have surrounded it with tanks, and you can actually drive underwater drones to explore what it would be like to explore another planet. And so as part of the mission, you take on the role of an aquanaut, or a communications engineer, or uh, the role of a biologist. And you have to decide what you found under the ice, if it's real or if it's not. So it's a really fun hands-on exhibit. We've also been collecting a series of NASA artifacts and artifacts from across the world that help us to tell greater stories. In fact, just this re week, we put up a uh, tile array that was used in the testing oh, to show so what cool. happened. Yeah. Um, when the Columbia had its accident. So you can actually see that. That's part of a new exhibit that will be opening later this year called Seeking Beyond, talking about the legacy of the space shuttle and the future that the uh, technology developed there will help us to explore deeper into space. So all sorts of new things all the time, little big exhibits, little new artifacts are coming in. So we invite you to come and see all the different things that are here at the Discovery Center. And you guys have a website that's going to tell you all about this. So if you guys uh, are interested and you want to come see them at any time, you want to see what's new, you want to see what events are coming up, um, Travis, can you tell us a little bit about that? Visit us on discoverspace.org or follow the Space Foundation on uh, Facebook, Twitter. I think we're on Instagram now, too. Yeah, you're even, in fact, they're even think, on Instagram. Yeah. yeah, I think on Instagram we have a, uh, a show where we make little crafts called Space Crafts. It's really fun. So if you want to watch something fun and have a little space-themed craft party, feel free to follow us on Instagram, too. Awesome, guys. Make sure that you like and uh, subscribe and make sure you share this with all your friends. And we can't wait to see you guys on the next episode of Clear Skies.